what the company's trying to, to explore for is, is most critical. Like what type of deposit, what scale of deposit, what is the price? Okay. I think that's the most important thing a retail investor needs to, to focus on. Hey, welcome back to The Dive. Our guest today is here to share his knowledge as a geologist. He will deep dive into deposits, metallurgy, greenfield projects, drill results, and what retail investors should know overall. Dr. Quinton Henning is joining us today. Hey, Quinton, welcome back to The Dive. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Cassandra. Uh, always a pleasure to talk. Okay, yeah, it's so nice to have you on. And we thought um, having a geologist with over 35 years of experience that loves to explain stuff to retail investors, that it would be a great idea if maybe we could use this as an educational experience for our audience and start off with a basic question. What is the difference between a porphyry and a VMS deposit? Okay, well, let's uh, let's pick this apart a little bit. Look, ore deposits form in different ways, but a lot of them are actually associated with, with heat and water. Think of it that way, okay? Because you have to have hot water to actually move metals around. Uh, the waters we're talking about are usually, you know, acid or they have other compounds in them that help carry the metal. All right. So if you kind of think of about it from that fundamental level, you can understand how most ore deposits form on Earth. It's a process of hot water carrying metals to a, uh, from one location to another and then concentrating them in that location. Okay. Now, the difference between a porphyry and a VMS is, is fairly straightforward. A porphyry, uh, why do we call it a porphyry? Well, because the intrusion, the magma that came up out of the ground, okay, that uh, forms the deposit. Uh, it, it had a lot of waters and metal uh, dissolved in it, okay? Uh, believe it or not, magmas can actually hold a lot of, a lot of goodies, in, including water, but also a lot of metals. And the, the magma, as it came up through the crust, it started to cool. It, it starts to cool as it gets near to the surface. And crystals start forming, okay? So in, in a porphyry, what you see are little crystals. You know, once it's all cooled and the rock has solidified, what you see are little crystals that are dispersed through the, the finer grain magmatic rock that forms. But what happens is as that thing starts to cool, there's a lot of metals that they simply can't find a home in the crystals that are forming and they get concentrated. So the metals like copper and gold and maybe zinc and silver and lead and other things, they all tend to get concentrated in those fluids, the water. That, that is the very last thing to come out of that magma as it's cooling. And then right at the end, boom, uh, this thing expels like in a shell around it. It actually flushes out all that metal uh, via the waters that are coming out of the magma. It ex ex expels it. It basically mineralizes everything around it like a big uh, halo. And that's what a porphyry deposit is. So it's, it's, you know, think of the porphyry as a vessel that's carrying the metal and waters up the surface. And then when it when it kind of finds a happy place in the crust, it starts to cool and crystallize, and then boom, it expels all those metals back out. It's like a delivery system. Think of it that way. Okay. Now, a VMS deposit is a deposit that forms from hot waters, but on the sea floor. Okay, VMS stands for Vulcanogenic Massive Sulfide Deposit, and a lot of folks have probably seen videos of these things called black smokers that occur along the sea floor. They're they're basically hot springs. You know, you can think of them as hot springs. That they come out of the bottom of the sea floor and they uh, issue this black smoke, which is just full of all sorts of different metals. And as that black smoke uh, comes out, it, it basically forms a mound. It builds up a mound, and this mound uh, is full of metal. It's full of sulfide minerals like uh, sphalerite and, and galena and chalcopyrin, which is you know zinc and lead and copper really. And um, you know these these deposits kind of form like a giant uh, mountain, if you will, you know, underneath the sea floor. Now, how do they form? Well, guess what? <laughs> There's probably a magma down the depths, right? And you can even have porphyries, believe it or not, or magmas, you know, similar to porphyries uh, that are, you know, not visible at where the VMS is forming, but they could be a short distance below uh, the VMS in the ocean crust. Okay, and so you know, in many respects, they're almost the same. Same process. The one difference is in a VMS, the metal is flushed out and it's deposited at the ocean floor. In the case of a porphyry, it's simply deposited as a halo around the intrusion. You know, and now you have to bring that VMS deposit up onto the 
continental crust, you know, up the surface here where we can mine them, you know, and that's that's through uh, collisional tectonics and things like that. But, you know, the, the way it formed in the first place is actually not all that different than a porphyry, believe it or not. So does one tend to be more high grade than the other? You know, typically, okay, that's a good question. Yeah, look, uh, you know, porphyry deposits, you know, they, they tend to disperse the mineralization in a fairly, you know, not necessarily perfectly homogenous, but fairly homogenous shell. And, and it tends to be a lower grade than most VMS deposits. So you, you can see, you know, like the porphyry, if you saw a half percent copper, 1% copper, you know, those are, those are pretty average porphyries. Like that's typical, okay? Uh, but in a, a VMS system, you can actually get a very high concentration of metal. In fact, many VMS deposits are, you know, multiples higher than grade than uh, a porphyry deposit. So you can get, you know, uh, copper deposits, copper rich VMS that might be, you know, two uh, percent, five percent, something like that, as opposed to the the porphyry, which is maybe a half percent to a percent. Uh, just a little bit different way they form, but. Uh, you know, it does uh, in a seafloor environment, you do get that concentration effect as those metals are kind of concentrated in that, that layer, that mound that forms around the black smoker. What would make either deposit type economic if you were looking at, say, copper or gold? Uh, you know, what I think if I had to phrase that question, uh, I would say what levels of dollar value uh, are necessary to make a a deposit work. I mean, whether it's copper or gold, you know, and in an open pit environment, look, you know, with the cost of open pit mining, which is often cheaper, uh, you can, you know, it's, uh, an open pit can be sustained by lower grades as a whole, you know, as opposed to underground. So for, in my my world, um, like $50, $60 of metal per ton, recoverable metal per, per ton is usually, uh, you know, something that can sustain an open pit mine, you know, it covers the cost of mining, and processing. So whether it's copper or whether it's gold or a combination of copper and gold, you know, I would say $50, $60 a ton, at least right now. Now, <laughs> given inflation, it might, you know, the costs are going up, so that might change. But, um, and we need to see metal prices go up too. But uh, look, uh, you know, $50, $60 a ton is kind of your, your basic threshold for economic uh, in the current state of the mining industry. Now, what does that mean? Well, a gram of gold is what, around... Six or excuse me, sixty dollars per gram right now. So a gram recoverable in an open pit, that'll work. Uh, what does it translate to in copper? Well, that's about 0.6 percent copper. Okay, so 0.6 percent works. No, no problem. Now there are some deposits that are lower grade than that, but you know, uh, the ones that really make money are are at least that level or higher. Okay, so let's move on and talk about metallurgy. How important is metallurgy for a project to be economic and how can, re how can retail investors easily evaluate this? You know, metallurgy is extremely important for any, any mine, okay? Uh, to understand metallurgy early in an exploration project is actually key. I, I like to see companies that do metallurgical work early because at the end of the day, you wanna know that you have a, a deposit, you have metals that you can actually extract uh, out of the rock and, and produce something of value. Okay, now a uh, metallurgy, while it's typically, you know, not, not the most exciting thing to investors perhaps, uh, it is actually very important because the metallurgy dictates uh, usually how, how much or whether that project is viable. Believe it or not, of all the different factors you might look at, uh, metallurgy is, is top of the list in my book, okay? And, and that was really beaten into me while I was uh, young and I was growing up in, in the bigger mining companies. Uh, we typically did metallurgy very, very early stage in any project that we worked on. It was just hands down. It was one of the first things we did. Okay, so to, to answer uh, your question about, you know, what, uh, what should retail investors look for or how, how can they best interpret it? Look, it's about recovery. You want to know what, the, what metal and what percentage of that metal can be extracted from, from the rock, whether it's a copper porphyry, for example, or whether it's some, some form of gold deposit, you know, uh, maybe a, a gold rich uh, epithermal deposit or something like this. You need to know how much of the metal can actually be extracted uh, through processing. Okay, now there are deposits that are plain, what we call refractory. Refractory in, in this context, in geologic context, means it's just, very, very difficult to extract the metals 
out of the rock and whatever metal you might be talking about, usually gold in this case, uh, it's just too difficult uh, without extreme chemistry or extreme heat or something, you know, some other, you know, uh, energy added. It's, it's difficult to pull the metal out. Now there's other, the other end of the spectrum is free milling deposits. When you hear the word free milling or, you know, um, you know metallurgically friendly deposits, uh, those are ones in which the, the metal can be extracted uh, cheaply and effectively. Okay, so the, the metallurgy, if we see uh, good recoveries in, you know, and I can ramble off some examples uh, in a heap leach for gold, you know, an oxide gold project, you wanna see recoveries above 70%, say, okay, that's, that's usually kind of the low bar for uh, recoveries of a heap leach operation. For a giant porphyry deposit, uh, you wanna see recoveries of copper of say 80% or better into a flotation concentrate. Uh, for, you know, for other types of deposits like high grade uh, veins, you know, underground veins, things like this that, uh, that might be uh, milled uh, very specifically in a specific ways, you want to, might want to see recoveries of 90% or better. Okay. Uh, you know, it depends on which deposit your type you're, you're looking at, but uh, you, it's all about recovery. You want to see uh, the extraction of metal be cost effective as well as, as, as high as possible. Okay. So that's my best answer. Uh, and it varies from deposit to deposit, but I think anybody that invests in the junior mining space should uh, do a little investigating on the internet around metallurgy and the, the values uh, that are created through metallurgical study. Because uh, at the end of the day, there's been a lot of investors burned by projects that were not metallurgically friendly. A lot of money was spent on those projects. And because uh, the metallurgy just didn't behave, you know, those projects ended in a heap. They basically uh, proved to be uh, unviable, uneconomically viable. So um, you don't want to land there. You want to you want to get smart. Any investor, any retail investor investing in this space, it is up to you to learn as much as possible. So let's say a retail investor is looking at a greenfield project, something exploration stage. What should they be mm -hmm. focused on outside of management? Would it be grab samples, soil samples? What do you think? Uh, look, if it's very early stage, uh, understanding what the company's trying to, to explore for is, is most critical. Like what type of deposit, what scale of deposit, what is the price? Okay. I think that's the most important thing a retail investor needs to, to focus on. Now, um, you, 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 part of that means that the company has to have a decent sized land position. Okay. There's a lot of companies that have maybe small postage stamp land positions, you know, and that's usually a red flag for me. If you see a company that's just kind of scattered to the wind where they have multiple, you know, small land holdings scattered across an area, usually that's just a, a land play. It's a promotional company. Okay. But if you see a company that has a district scale land package and you can understand what they're trying to find, are they trying to find, you know, a, a hundreds of millions of tons of porphyry mineralization, or are they trying to find a very high grade VMS depositor? you know, very high grade orogenic gold deposits, something like this. You, you need to understand what the prize is. Okay, now how do, we, how do we determine this from the data the company presents? Well, it's a bit of an art form, but uh, as you learn more and more as a retail investor about uh, these different types of deposit, us crazy geologists chase, I think you get a better and better sense of, of what is meaningful. Okay, so for example, and look, I would have to go through the myriad of deposits to explain every single one, but you know, let me give you some examples. Um, in in orogenic gold, okay, uh, you know, a lot of the the first evidence we have about what a system might deliver really does come from uh, some of the earliest sampling that's done, and and the rocks that are actually sampled. You know, the visible characteristics of the rocks. I can tell, for example. Uh, kind of what level an orogenic system is by looking at the textures of the quartz and, and certainly the grades. Oftentimes, if you see very high grades, especially if a project delivers, you know, high grades, even spot samples, channel samples, uh, trend samples over and over again, you know, that's usually a very good sign. It means uh, it might be an epizonal gold system, a la newfound gold, you know, something just extraordinary. Okay, uh, other orogenic systems where you see lots of low grade, um, you know, it might mean you're a little too high in the system or you, maybe you're, you know, in a, a different, you know, distal part of the system, whatever. But, um, you know, grade is definitely a focus, uh, you know, but that said, uh, you got to look at the scale too. Okay. So when you, when you start to see a map that shows you the distribution of the grades that they've collected or samples they've collected, 
that uh, that can often give you a sense of scale. If, if the scale is there, you know, you don't want something that's 100 meters long. You want something that's a kilometer long. OK, <laughs> I don't care what time of deposit is. You want something that's got some uh, size to it. OK, so I would urge people to, um, you know, to pay attention to the scale bar in the lower left corner or the lower right corner. There's usually a scale bar. <laughs> and, and if you okay. pay attention, you, you understand the space, you know, that that concept, I think that's very valuable. It's it's one thing to look at a list of numbers, you know, a sample numbers and say, oh, wow, those are great numbers. But if you if you look and you say, well, gee, that, that only came out of a trench 20 meters long, big deal, okay? <laughs> you wanna see something big. So you wanna see uh, data over a broad area. Like this is very general answer, um, very, you know, broad brush, but that those would be the basics. You know, you wanna focus on property size, the scale of the the area that they're working, the sampling that they're doing, obviously grade. You know, those are the biggest. Okay, okay. So one other thing that seems to confuse investors are the different uh, surveys, like electromagnetics, for example, um, mm -hmm. that are used to evaluate exploration properties. Can you explain what exactly these maps are telling us? Uh, yes, I okay. To talk about geophysics is uh, you know it confuses a lot of geologists. <laughs> I'll be blunt. You know, uh, uh, if you if you look at uh, the different the myriad of different ge uh, geophysical techniques that are available to us out there, uh, you know you have to you have to understand what each one of them actually is is collecting, like what you know signal it's collecting. Uh, but you also have to understand in what context it's telling you something about what might be in the ground. Okay, now there's different types of geophysics. There's electromagnetic geophysics, which is basically looking at the electrical properties of the rocks. Uh, there is other geophysics like uh, you know magnetic surveys that's looking at the mag magnetism of the rocks. And yes, there are minerals that are magnetic, like magnetite, for example. Okay, then there's things like gravity. You can actually look at the, gra the density of the rock below your feet using gravity. Okay, that's another technique. And there's other techniques, but, you know, broad brush, we have you know, kind of techniques in the electromagnetic end of the spectrum uh, and then techniques more in the physical end of the spectrum, uh, meaning gravity. You know, uh, it depends on what you're looking for. OK, uh, each deposit type has different characteristics and therefore it dictates what type of geophysical technique we use. And, and what kind of response we get, you know, is is definitely interpreted, um, you know, commensurately with whatever technique is used. So, uh, for example, okay, um, if you're looking for very dense rocks, like a VMS system that might be shallow to surface, an example would be Pan Global in, um, in Spain. They did gravity surveys. They put uh, gravity stations all over the target area they're looking for. Why did they do this? Well, they wanted to find bodies of dense rock below the subsurface without drilling. They wanted to know where are their bodies of dense rock, okay? Gravity did a wonderful job showing that. And now they have a very clear illustration, you know, of, or picture of where all of these, these uh, VMS deposits are in the subsurface. They can start drilling it with very high success. Very effective technique, by the way. Uh, you know, you can use the same thing for a lot of intrusive hosted deposits like, uh, you know, nickel deposits, for example. Um, you know, Voises Bay had a gravity signature, uh, you know, things like that, too. Now, in the magnetic end of the spectrum, well, uh, porphyries. Porphyries often have a magnetic expression. Uh, the scarn around a porphyry, you know, meaning the, the rock that's kind of cooked up and mineralized around the edge of a porphyry, that can also have a magnetic, uh, you know, uh, characteristic that's very distinct. Uh, so, you know, that's, you know, magnetism is, is used for a lot, but I would say most directly for targeting in porphyries and scarns and things of that ilk. Now, electromagnetic uh, surveys, you're either looking at rocks that have uh, a lot of, they're, they're chargeable, okay, meaning the minerals in the rock can soak up electricity like a static, you know, in a balloon, you, know, you rub a balloon on your head you get static buildup, okay? So you can you can actually pump electricity in the ground. And if, if there are minerals that like to attract that electricity, they will soak it up and hold on to it. Okay, that's called chargeability. In other words, how much you know electric charge can you build up in the ground? But then there's also uh, conductivity, okay? That's uh, how easily electricity can pass through rocks in the ground. And there are rocks that allow electricity to, to actually pass through the ground like a current, okay? It actually flows through the ground. And depending on, you know, what you're looking for, like if you're looking for 
disseminated pyrite that's associated with the deposit, maybe a porphyry, maybe a VMS, whatever, you can get uh, you can get very chargeable response and you can get a very conductive response. Okay, so that's a bit of an art form interpreting exactly uh, you know what what the data is telling you, but it is very effective. Uh, conductivity and chargeability are very effective at seeing. Uh, direct properties of rocks that might be associated with ore bodies in the ground. Okay, so we we use those very selectively, okay. and we interpret results very selectively. Okay, so there can't really be a favorite way. It's just depending on what you're looking for, which one works best. Yeah, usually usually when you do a, a geophysics on a project, you do you collect multiple data sets. Okay, so if you're deploying okay. a crew out to to collect data you might as well collect as much as you can okay you might okay. you might get you know there's other things too like radiometrics but you might you might send a crew out and they get magnetic data and electromagnetic data and radiometrics okay. and gravity and the whole hua but you know the the best way to explore is get as much information as you can okay this is the important thing about geophysics is that the it, it's relatively cheap okay it's relatively cheap but it can it can help you define targets and save you a heck of a lot of money in drilling. Okay, the better your yes. deal, the better your focus, and you're able to spend money more effectively. Yeah, that's the whole idea sure. here. So the more data you have, the better. Yeah, so let's move on and talk about the exploration project and shift to drilling now. Um, could you explain the difference okay. between the, the various drilling methods, uh, such as reverse circulation or diamond drilling? Uh, yeah, look, uh, the, it's different forms of drilling. Reverse circulation is is a, a form where the bit that, that goes into the ground, the, the actual drill itself, as it penetrates the ground, it grinds the rock up into small particles. And then those small particles are actually uh, literally sucked out of the ground up the center uh, rod of the pipe. And they come out and you collect that material. And that is your sample. Okay, That is those cuttings, those little chips of rock that come out of the ground serve as your sample, not only for assay, you know, the, to measure the amount of metal in the rocks, but also as a record. Like you put, you put a little bit of those chips into a chip tray so that you have a geologic record. You can look at that chip tray and say, ah, okay, we were in sandstone and then we went into shale and, you know, whatever. You can look at the chips and actually say something meaningful. All right, so that's RC drilling and it, it cost $40, $40 a meter, $80 a meter, depending on where you're at in the planet, but it's reasonably cheap, okay? Uh, now, core drilling uh, is more expensive. Core drilling can be, you know, $100, $200, $300 a meter easily, okay? Uh, in fact, today, I think the average price is probably north of $200 a meter around the planet. Okay, now, core drilling, what you're doing is you're taking a, a bit that is actually a hollow cylinder that has diamonds around the edge of it. And as it spins, as it cuts down through the rock, there's a core, a, a tube, or sorry, a, a cylinder of rock that, that comes uh, up into the core barrel. So you actually end up with a stick of rock. Okay, and then they pull that, that stick of rock out and that becomes your drill core. So you actually end up with cylinder, like a, a complete cylinder of rock. And then that rock is, can be logged. You can see you know, all the geology you want, but then you saw it down the middle, you submit half of it for assay, and uh, you know you've got a half of it for a permanent record too, so your your geology is preserved there, uh, you know, as as a half core split. So look, you know, it's it's uh, if if you really want good geology and you you really want to understand things, you want to get probably better recoveries. You're probably going to do core drilling, even though it's more expensive. But RC drilling is very effective. It's is cost effective, and you know you can you can generate good quality results. It's not like you know, one's better than the other. It's it's really just a matter of, uh, you know, different technique and different different depths. Like you can only RC drill down to maybe, you know, 300 meters fairly confidently, whereas core drilling can go to 3,000 meters, you know, confidently. Okay. So, wow. yeah. Okay. okay. So what would make a good drill program outside of the meter count? What makes a successful drill program? Look, meters, I like to see a lot of meters. I like to see companies that are aggressive with drilling. Drilling is really what makes discoveries. You know, there's no question that you need drilling. You need, you know, demonstrable evidence of, of the rock in the ground and, and the metal it contains to make a successful discovery. There's no question. Okay, so I like to see companies that drill, you know, at Crestcat, the group I work with, we have invested in companies that currently have about 160 drills operating around the world. Okay, we're truly committed to, to seeing success made through the drill bit. Okay, now... Um, 
what makes a program successful? Well, once the drilling is done and the, the results come in, the first thing I look at is, you know, the, are the results in the context of, of what is being sought? Okay, if, if you're looking for a large porphyry, well, I want to see long intercepts of, of significant intervals of, you know, potentially economic mineralization. I don't want to see, you know, little short intervals of, of sub-economic mineralization. I want to see long intervals that say, yeah, we've got a very large volume of rock that is potentially mineralized here, you know, 0. 0.5, 0. 0.6% copper, for example, something like that, you know, and over hundreds of meters or maybe even a thousand meters, okay? Uh, in a high-grade orogenic system, well, I want to see intervals that are, are a few meters or a few tens of meters of very high grade, you know, eight, 10, 15 grams per ton or more even in some cases like Newfound. Okay, so, you know, it really depends on the context of what they're looking for to determine the degree of success. But as a rule of thumb, okay, you can actually do, uh, you can take the grade and multiply it by the meterage of an intercept and you can actually come up with some, some metrics that start to allow you to kind of compare success, you know, from one project to another, regardless of what type of geology you have. Okay, so in, in the gold world, we can take the grams per ton over the meters of the intercept, you know, five meters, or excuse me, five grams per ton over 20 meters. Well, five times 20 is 100. Okay, that's a 100 gram meter intercept. Okay, when I start to see projects that continually deliver or consistently deliver, especially at an early stage, a 100 gram meter or more intercepts of gold, I get excited, okay? Now that might be 100 meters of a gram, 100 times one is 100. It might be uh, two meters of 50 grams, two times 50 is 100, okay? Again, but by multiplying those two together and saying, okay, 100 gram meter is kind of my lower threshold for getting excited. Uh, I like to see 100 gram meter holes and routinely, especially at an early stage, those types of discoveries. So statistically, if you look at uh, all of the drilling that's been done on this planet and you look at projects that deliver 100 gram meter or better intercepts, those are the ones that typically succeed. Okay. So um, let's move on and talk about Nubo resources before we let you go here. We have three okay. figures from your news release from June 21st when you announced a new style of gold mineralization encountered in Australia. Could you walk us through what each figure means in simple terms? We'll start with figure one here. Okay, yes, this, this project, Malmesbury, is in Victoria State, so it's in Southeast Australia. It happens to be about uh, 50 kilometers due south of the Fosterville mine, which is a very famous uh, high-grade gold deposit that, uh, that was, been, was mined by Newmarket, but then Kirkland Lake bought them out once they hit the high grade at the uh, Swan Zone and uh, became a very famous mine, made a lot of people a lot of money. Okay, so the reason that Novo is interested in this Malmesbury project is this project has geology that is very, very similar to Fosterville. Okay, now what does that mean? Well, um, we can see here a map that shows all the sedimentary rocks, which are very much like those that host the deposit of Fosterville. Those are in the very light shades, the pastel shades. But then right in the middle there, you can see uh, a granitic intrusion. It's actually a dike-like thing, like a linear feature uh, that, that is closely associated with a new style of mineralization that's been discovered. And it, quite frankly, at Fosterville, they have very good evidence that right below the, the high-grade zone or at depth below, there is likely an intrusion that is related to that high-grade mineralization. Okay, so what we're seeing here at uh, Malmesbury is our signs that we are in the right type of system. We've hit, um, we've hit some very high grades, hole 16, which was announced a few weeks ago, uh, actually hit multiple high grade intervals. People can go back and look at that. Uh, I think it was around early May, if I remember right, maybe mid-May. And then um, we've hit this uh, more disseminated style of mineralization in the granite, in the intrusive rock uh, here more recently. What is this telling us? It tells us we have the right ingredients now. It's not necessarily an economic intercept, this one that we've re announced recently, but it is very important from the stance that it is one of the key ingredients that could point to uh, the fact that this might be an analog for Fostenum. Here you can see uh, a, a, a cross section. This is basically like a slice through the ground through uh, two drill holes that intersected this intrusive uh, feature. So that pink feature, that flame-like feature is the granite that's come up. And you can see that as, as we've drilled down, there was an intercept near surface. Uh, you can see 20 
23 meters of nearly half a gram close to surface in one of the early holes uh, that was drilled on the property. But now we fit this lower hole, 80 meters of 0.26. It's not economic in its own right, but what it says is there is uh, an intrusive here that is you know, potentially a causative or gold rich uh, source rock for this, this uh, whole gold system here. And you know, maybe nearby, maybe nearby we have a Fosterville type deposit. And, and this photograph here just simply shows a close-up of, of the intrusive rock. So the gray rock that's kind of hosting those white quartz veins, that gray rock is the granite that's formed that dike-like feature, that, that intrusive feature. And then the white veins that, that you see there are quartz. Those quartz veins uh, also have sulfide in the darker minerals that you see in there. Uh, some include uh, arsenopyrite and stibnite and things like this. Those are very, very uh, telltale signs of a uh, shallow epizonal system. Um, what does that mean? It means fossil. It means that there's a very good chance of finding a fossil type discovery here. And now we can start to see uh, this evidence in core. Well, so much to take in there, Quentin. Um, all right. <laughs> that's, all, that's all we have for you today. But uh, thank you so much for doing with this with us. We've learned a lot. Thank you. No problem. Anytime. Good to see you, Cassandra. We'll see you. you take care. Yeah. Okay. You See too. Ya. Bye. Bye.